Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is algebra. Today I would like to tell you something about probably one of the most important theorems in the uh, theory of finite groups, the so the so-called Thule theorem. Um, well, I'm not quite sure whether I should say the Zulu theorem or Zulu theorems, you will see. There are quite a few statements related to um, so-called Zulu subgroups. And one of them is really important. One of them is really, really important and I will stress that, but uh, usually you will see something like three of them. Um, I, will also, I will show you everything that is kind of related to Zulu subgroups, motivate why you should expect them to be true. And then, as I said, stress why one of them is really important and also in my humble opinion, really, really surprising. So the others are like, mm, I don't want to diss them, but the others are more like, yeah, this is nice to know, uh, but one of them is, is really, really surprising. And I try to explain that a little bit. Uh, the point will be that they are kind of, there are certain canonical substructures, canonical substructures in groups, which is, something a priori you wouldn't expect because groups are pretty wild objects in some sense. There are quite a few of them, um, but all of them have some nice canonical substructures depending on their order, as you will see. Um, but let me try to motivate it. And in some sense, this is, this is the real motivation. This is kind of how Zulu arrived at, uh, at his statements, whatever, 140 years ago, roughly. So he was looking at Galois theory. Well, nowadays you would rather state it in terms of group act abstract group actions. And that's what I'm going to do. But basically it's about the certain symmetries in the group and certain elementary symmetries of a group. So let's have a look, just let's to get started. Let's have a look at a hopefully very familiar group, the symmetry group of the Pentagon. Um, that's of order 10. Okay. The symmetry group of the Pentagon is certainly of order 10. And here are the 10 corresponding elements. And the way I illustrated, these are, is I have a pentagon outside. As you can see, my drawing skills for pentagons are really bad. But I have a pentagon outside and the symmetry of the pentagon is any operation you can perform that such that I can't tell the difference to the pentagon, right? You perform some operation, I look away. And, well, I should look away before. So I look away, you perform some operations and um, when I, when I uh, look again at the Pentagon, I can't see a difference. Usually that's a little bit hard to illustrate because the whole point is I can't see the difference. So I add in some asymmetry here by giving basically um, colors to, to, the, to the corners of the Pentagon. So I have uh, a, a black triangle here, which kind of helps you to should see this rotational symmetry of the, of the um, Pentagon. So I use it as a, as, a, as a marker for the rotational symmetry. As you can see, I hope this works pretty well. And um, the Pentagon has also a reflection. So this is my A, right? So A is my rotational symmetry and I just write A, A squared, for example, I do A twice, I do A three times, I do A four times um, and so on. But the Pentagon also has a reflectional symmetry. In order to indicate this, I use the rest of the corners. Like um, you should think about it like this: um, start at my black triangle, and look to the left. Right. So you see an uh, orange, yellow type triangle, and this will be the same for all of these here. So you see an orange type triangle to the left, but the reflection reverses that. So here you actually see a blue triangle to the left, right? So the reflection basically, well, it's, it's a reflection along this axis that, so it ex exchanges those two triangles and exchanges those two triangles. And my way to illustrate this is just to use two different colors um, for those other triangles. So I have my pointer triangle, the black one, and I have two different other colors to illustrate the reflection symmetry. And yeah, you just write it down and you get 10, 10 answers uh, to 10, 10 symmetries. So, so far so good. Groups are symmetries. I hope uh, you agree with this by now, um, but maybe we can see a little bit more. Maybe we can see, say something about like elementary symmetries of, a, of, a, of, a, of a, let's say of a pentagon. And what could an elementary symmetry be? Well, if you think about it for a little bit, it's not completely obvious, but maybe it is related to the prime factors of your group. 
the, the order of the group, and it actually is. So um, the prime factors of 10 are two and five. I hope that's not, not a too hard calculation. I think I can do it in my head. So maybe you, so you should be able to do that as well. I'm really, really bad in doing calculations in my head, but I can do two times five. Um, so these are my two prime factors. So maybe the really the elementary symmetries of the pentagon, and you can kind of already see it here. So the rotation is of order five and the reflection, so this is order five and the reflection is of order two, of course. These are kind of the two symmetries that you already see. Um, but it's just kind of an arbitrary choice. So let's have a look um, on all order two elements or stated otherwise on all subgroups of order two. Remember two was our first uh, prime factor. So 10 was two times five, of course. Uh, and I'm focusing now on two. I mean, kind of ignoring five. And it turns out that there wasn't, there was, the act there was actually no choice. So I mean, okay. The, I have chosen basically this axis, and of course I can choose a different axis as illustrated here. So this was the choice from before. Here you can see the chosen axis. I can also choose this one. So I can choose an, a reflection axis basically through all, not just basically. I can choose a reflection axis that goes through um, uh, a fixed uh, corner of my pentagon, and I have five of them, of course. And this is how they look like. I'm just in, in the usual illustrations of those were the two here. If I reflect here, you should be able to see that those two four places. And because it's a reflection, if you do it twice, you're back to where you started, right? So um, these are all subgroups of order two. Um, and well, this was a bad formulation. So they are, of course, subgroups of order two, but the point is these are all subgroups of order two. So there are only five of them and they're given by those reflections. And the main point is, okay, you have those subgroups of order two, very good. And I kind of want to say, um, I, I, there wasn't really a choice, right? I, I, there should be something canonical. I, I made a choice, but there wasn't really. And it turns out that all of these subgroups are conjugate, namely in this case, conjugate by rotation. And you, uh, you can see this, of course, because I just can just rotate my axis, right? And I would get, for example, from here to here and so on. So all of those canonical uh, generating symmetries are kind of the same. Whatever I choose here, it's, it's kind of the same anyway. And up to conjugation is exactly kind of um, uh, the thing you should expect um, as kind of an equality uh, in, in the sense of looking at subgroups. So basically what I just said is they are the same up to relabeling. Or in other words, they're the same up to choosing a different different uh, vertex, a different edge corner, uh, corner of my pentagon. Right, the, all corners of the pentagon are equal. There's no way to prefer any of over the other. And this is a formal statement. All subgroups of order two are conjugate. And that's very surprising in some sense. Um, so there was no choice. Uh, it looks like, it look, really looked like I made a choice, but there was no choice. No, and not at least for the reflection. For the reflection, there was actually no, not really a choice. And the certain, same turns out for the, um, for, the, for the order. Remember, 10 is still two times five. So it's the same turns out for the five. So we would like to look at possible subgroups, possible subsymmetries of order five. And it turns out that this is on the nose unique. Um, so that's certainly also unique up to conjugation, but this is on the nose unique and it's exactly the rotation. So uh, as soon as you choose any of these elements here, as you're generating your rotation, you get, get all the others. For example, if you choose this one, let's say this one here, which moves the black triangle to, to this place, well, you can just continue. Then the black triangle moves two steps further, the black triangle moves two steps further, the black triangle moves two steps further, and so on. So you can generate all the others. So no matter what, what, what you take here, you generate all the others. And this is the unique way of doing it. The unique um, subsymmetry of order five. And the surprising statement is now that this holds true in general for any finite group. 
So he has a Zulu theorem with uniqueness being usually the second Zulu theorem. And I, I think it's the most important one. Um, for a reason I'm going to explain again, or well, yes. Um, so the formal statement is to take a finite group, uh, write your finite group, the order of the finite group as a prime power times an element M and P doesn't divide M anymore. So you really pull out the biggest prime power you can find. So R is maximum, right? So this R is maximum. Really look at this illustration. So here's P to the R and it's kind of the maximum thing. Um, and I just illustrated in two ways because um, not to confuse anyone. So the, the green one, the two here was the prime I pulled out and the five was also the prime I pulled out. So for each different prime factor, you pull out the biggest power and M is kind of the remainder that, that, that doesn't matter anymore in, well, in some sense. And then the statements are, okay, you do that and you look for the elementary subsymmetries of the corresponding order. And the statement is there exists something. So this is an existence statement. There exists a subgroup for all of those prime powers. In particular, look at down here, there exists this maximal subgroup of order P to the R. There exist sub smaller subgroups. As soon as you have a big symmetry, you certainly also have smaller symmetries. Um, but the point is there exist uh, uh, the kind of this maximal subgroup. And these are called the P pseudo subgroups. So my P was chosen and they are called the P pseudo subgroups. And the point now is, so this is, this is kind of the first Dulos theorem that you usually see, but my, my point C, I, may, I say it again, my point C is the most important one. All of these maximal subgroups are conjugate, okay? There's a unique, in the best way of uniqueness that you can, could expect here, there's a unique of those subgroups. So there is a unique maximal symmetry, which, has, which is of order P to the R. And that's a, very, that's a very surprising statement and it's extremely crucial. It tells you, you really should look at those things because as you will see, groups tend to have a lot of subgroups. And if there's a preferable one, it's definitely telling you, trying to tell you something about the overall structure of the group. Okay. And then there are two other statements, like you can say something about the number of, of those subgroups. There are some numerical criteria they have to satisfy. And um, a P pseudo subgroup is normal if and only if there's only one of them. Not even up to conic AC, but there's really just only one. This happens rarely. Um, but yeah, anyway, so the point is part C. The uniqueness. So th these things are unique in the strongest possible sense. And in order to give you a feeling how strong and how surprising the statement actually is, let's have a look at the symmetric groups. So here I've listed uh, the symmetric groups up to S8, right? S8 was just a symmetric group in eight elements. So the permutation of the permutations of the set one to eight. And you list the order of them that's n factorial. Um, so I just did that. For example, S8 is eight factorial, which is two to the seven, three squared, five and seven. So Zulu theorem now tells you that unique, unique up to conjugacy, there's a unique symmetry of this order, subsymmetry, there's a unique subsymmetry of this order, there's a unique subsymmetry of this order. So always the maximum power that you see and there's a unique subsymmetry of this order, which is a extremely surprising statement because this group S8 already has this ridiculous number of subgroups. And even if you don't care for subgroups really on, on the nose of elements, but for subgroups up to conjugacy, you still have around 300 of them. And so there, there's zillions, groups have zillions of subgroups. And there's no way why anyone, any of those uh, well, there is no a priori reason why any of those should be preferable over, over all the others. Why should, should certain subgroups uh, of those 300 up to conjugacy should be preferable? And Zulu theorem actually tells you there are some preferable subsymmetries, kind of some maximal subsymmetries, and they're unique in the best possible way. Uh, so that's why this, this so-called second um, Zulu theorem is a very, very strong property. Okay, so let me wrap up. So we have the Zulu theorems, which tells you something about um, certain subsymmetries of, of your group. It's very easy. You just write your group, the order of your group as um, being something P to the R, 
times the remainder, and you will see something of this order, right? So P to the R is the order of your sub symmetry. And this is basically unique and satisfies some numerical properties. And again, the point is that it's basically unique. So finding this subsymmetries uh, sub or subgroups should be an important thing to do because they usually tell you quite a lot about the group uh, that you started with, about the, the big beast. So small things tell you a lot about the big beast. In any way, I hope you enjoyed the video and I also hope to see you next time.